we finished Joshua chapter 7. And so now we'll be picking up now in Joshua chapter 8. And I've titled today's message, The Rematch at AI. But I came across this funny little, uh, this funny little interaction from Charlie Brown. So Charlie Brown was complaining because his team always lost their games. Lucy attempted to console him with, remember Charlie Brown, you learn more from your defeats than from your victories. Charlie Brown responded, then I must be the smartest person in the world. Yes, it's absolutely true that all of us, all of us must learn from our defeats, our mistakes, our setbacks. It's important we do that. But still, I also know that in that moment, in that moment of defeat, in that moment when we have just hang our head and just feel like it's the end of everything, it will demoralize you. It'll, make you, it'll just make you want to give up. And so that's what the nation of Israel must have been feeling at the end of chapter 7. All the momentum that they had achieved by the miraculous crossing of at, by the miraculous crossing of the Jordan and the supernatural victory over Jericho suddenly ended by the defeat at Ai. By the end of the events of Joshua 7, Joshua, the leaders, and the congregation of Israel were taking their gloves off in defeat and also mourning the death of 36 soldiers. They were probably wondering, contemplating, thinking in their minds, how do we recover from this loss? How are we supposed to regain that momentum? Now, by all accounts and purposes, you know, if you look at everything on paper, it seemed like it just wouldn't be, it just seemed like they would just be easily, easily knock off AI and move on to conquering the next city. Israel's army not only outnumbered, outsized the army of AI, but they also believed they had an amazing plan. They also believed and trusted that the plan that they came up with was flawless. Yet there she sits, defeated by the underdog, AI, enveloped by a thick fog of gloom and despair. Before they moved on, before they moved on to the next what they had to do next, they needed to deal with this trauma. They needed to deal with this defeat. They needed to accept this reality. When God was on their side, the thick walls of Jericho's secure fortress fell at a commanded shout. But when God wasn't with them, neither a shout nor a sword could help her win. So in the passages we'll be covering today, we're going to see what God did for his people immediately after they removed the evil in their midst. We're going to read how God gave Israel a do-over, a second chance to redeem them from the defeat that they had experienced. So church, the lesson I hope that you will learn through this story is that we have a God who is faithful. We have a faithful God and he redeemed sinful humanity by giving his own son. So as God's people, we must choose to obey and tell the story of our, of your second chance 
in the power of the Holy Spirit. So before we get into God's word, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us all here. Thank you for loving us, for, for sending your son to die for us. Lord, for giving us a mouth and, and ears to, to, to be able to worship you, Lord. And it was a beautiful time of worship. I pray as we get into your word now, Lord, that you will speak powerfully. Use your word now to, to change lives, change hearts, change perspectives, Lord. That you will heal, especially those who are in the midst of defeat. Who feel like there's no hope. Who feel like they can never recover. Reveal to them that you are a God of second chances. That you are a God of do-overs. And when you're there and when you're working, Lord, when your people surrender to your will, you work powerfully. You give the victory. So now we want to hear from you. So remove all distractions, Lord. Let's focus on you and you alone now. Keep us safe. All of us, Lord. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Joshua chapter 8, verse 1. The Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid or discouraged. Take all the troops with you and go attack Ai. Look, I have handed over to you the king of Ai, his people, city, and land. Treat Ai and its king as you did Jericho and its king, except that you may plunder its spoil and livestock for yourself. Set an ambush behind the city. And we just want to stop there for now because there's so much to unpack in just those two verses. When Achan's crime was judged, God's favor towards Israel was restored and he reassured Joshua that he had not forsaken him or the people. When Joshua heard God's word of encouragement, it was as if his heart received a jump start. It was rekindled. See, these words that he heard from God were basically the same words Moses spoke in Kedesh Barnea, when he sent out the 12, the 12 spies in Deuteronomy chapter 1, there were also the same words Moses said to Joshua 40 years later when he was handing over the leadership baton over to him in Deuteronomy chapter 31. This was confirmed when Joshua heard those words again back in Joshua chapter 1 verse 9. And God spoke to him just after the death of Moses. And so now, at this crucial time in Joshua's life, it felt good to be reminded and reassured that God was ready to lead if, let me emphasize that, if Joshua was ready to listen to his plan. A plan that I'm sure by this point, Joshua was like, I am following it to a T. I'm not going to deviate. I'm going to make sure that everyone else is going to be following it as well. But as eager as he was to make things right this second time around, Joshua was discovering for himself that, yes, God is a God of second chances. This was a lesson that Jonah learned when he was given a second chance after initially refusing to go to Nineveh and preach to that adversarial nation. There it tells us the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Get up, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach the message that I 
will tell you. We'll get more into that in a bit, but right after this, God begins instructing Joshua to take all the troops of Israel's of Israel, all the fighting men, the soldiers, with him and go attack Ai. Why didn't just why didn't God just tell Israel, you know what, just for now, skip Israel, I mean skip Ai. Let's, you know, slick our wounds and just move on to the next city and eventually we'll come back and deal with that problem. He could, you know, God, uh, why didn't God just say that? Because they weren't ready. After this defeat, they weren't ready to wage war against another opponent. Israel needed to face Ai a second time. That rematch was necessary. Friends, church, some places and experiences cannot be evaded or avoided. They must, they must be faced again. Jacob had to go back to Bethel. And the prodigal son had to go home to the father. In Revelation chapter 2, the Lord tells the Ephesian church, they must return Remember and repent because they had, you remember what it was? They had left their first love. In Hosea chapter 3, verse 1, the Lord commands Hosea to go back and buy his wife back and take her into his home. So there was no avoiding it. Joshua and Israel must go back to where they got their butts kicked and face Ai a second time. Like them, and maybe like many of you, and I also know how difficult it is to go back to those places where we suffer defeat, hurt, and embarrassment. I know that it's a lot easier to skip over it and move on, to just not revisit that place. I know, because there are many times in my past where I've tried to do that. And I wasn't, I learned by doing that that I just wasn't able to move on until I dealt with, with that issue, that problem, that defeat, that hurt, that embarrassment. But here's the thing, even though we're all products of the past, we must not be prisoners of that past. Don't be a prisoner of that past. Visit the past. Just don't make the mistake of living there, going back there and settling down and making your home there and in that place. When you do go there, though, you must remember, you must remember God's graciousness to you. Remember how faithful God was when he sent his beloved son to die for you, to die for your sins and redeem you. Remember everything that the Lord did on the cross for you, that you're no longer that person, that you're no longer defined by those mistakes, by those defeats. You are a new creation. You now, through Jesus, have the victory. Because of him, you are victorious. By remembering those things, it will stir the Holy Spirit that's in you to obey him and tell the story of how God rescued you 
and gave you a second chance. Yes, it's factually true that the Israelites lost to Ai. It was clear. There was no denying it. There wasn't. Everybody knew they had lost. But guess what? It's also true that God is now telling them to go back and fight a second time. In professional sports, it's standard for teams to go back and review game film so they can see their errors, correct them, and then play the next game with a new game plan to give them the victory. Someone once said, it's better to fail with a plan than to succeed without a plan. And what he meant by that was, if a person succeeds without a plan, the individual will not know how to succeed the next time he faces or participates in a similar situation. However, if a person had a plan and failed, the individual can go back and rethink that plan, rethink the plan, tweak the plan, and adjust the plan in an effort to come up with a new plan that will bring success during the next encounter. Folks, sometimes God calls us to review the film of our lives so we can see where we failed and come short of his intended purpose for us. There's no need to adjust the plan he has for our lives. It's written. It's written there in the Bible. Your responsibility as believers, as Christians, as followers of Christ, is to adjust your life to the unadjustable Word of God so that you can live victorious lives. leads me to this important question. Have you been to AI? This is a metaphor for returning to the past, to turn, returning to past reality. And as I mentioned, at, at times, AI cannot be avoided. It's difficult, yes, to revisit those places of pain and defeat. AI is a place we go to get help to help us return to the original blueprint of God's plan for our lives. Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, came to address what happened in the ultimate AI of human history where our first father, where our first human father failed the first time, Adam. When Christ came to planet Earth, he came as our Savior. And the next time, the next time he comes, in case you didn't know, he will come as judge. He came the first time because humanity had been defeated here. He came to rescue us from sin. The next time he comes, he will come to receive us unto himself, a people made victorious in living through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now before revealing the actual plan to Joshua. The Lord informs him in verse 2, spoil of Ai, and also its livestock, it now could be taken by Israel. Do you see the mind-blowing irony here? If only Achan had suppressed his greedy and selfish desires and had just obeyed God's word at Jericho, he would have eventually just had all the treasure he wanted. 
But not just that, my friends. He would have also had God's blessing too. You see, the path of obedience and faith is always, is always the best. Let me repeat that. The path of obedience and faith is always the best. Again, Achin could have prevented the premature deaths of his family and the destruction of his properties had he obeyed, had he been patient. Jesus reminds us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Be patient. Don't be so quick to, to rush into the worldly treasures, into the things this world has to offer you. Remember, the Lord has better treasures in store for you. He has better things planned out for you. Yes, I know, take, you know, make the right moves and or hire at the right place and talk to the right people. You may attain that position. You may, uh, that will give you the income that you've always wanted or you, know, you could be looking for other ways to strike it rich. But that really isn't going to do anything for you, ultimately eternally. I've heard the phrase, the saying, more money, more problems. But with Christ, with Jesus, it's not that way. When you trust in him, and you obey him, he will show you a better way and he will teach you and show you that it's better just to wait. It's better just to be patient. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, church. So now, as I cover those two verses, I mean, those two verses alone, I can preach the entire time about, but I just want to cover um, the other portion of our passage. So let's pick up in verse 3. If you have your Bibles open, Joshua chapter 8, verse 3. So Joshua and all the troops set out an attack, set out to attack Ai. Joshua selected 30,000 of his best soldiers and sent them out at night. He commanded them, "Pay attention, lie in ambush, lie in ambush behind the city, not too far from it, and all of you be ready. Then I and all the people who are with me will approach the city." They came out against us as they did the first time. We will flee from them. They will come after us until we have drawn them away from the city so that they will say they are fleeing from us as before. While they're fleeing from them, you are to come out of your ambush and seize the city. The Lord your God will hand it over to you. After taking the city, set it on fire. Follow the Lord's command. See that you do as I have ordered you. So Joshua sent them out, and they went out to the ambush site and waited between Bethel and Ai to the west of Ai. But he spent the, that night with the troops. Joshua started early the next morning and mobilized them. Then he and the elders of Israel led the troops up to Ai. All those who were with him went up at, and approached the city, arriving opposite of Ai and camped to the north of it, with the valley between them and the city. And Joshua had taken about 5,000 men and set them in ambush between Bethel and Ai to the west of the city. The troops were stationed in this way, the main camp to the north of the city and its rear guard to the west of the city. And that night Joshua went into the valley. When the king of Ai saw the Israelites, the men of the city, hurried and went out of the city uh, in the morning so that, they, so that he and all his people could engage Israel in battle at a suitable place facing the Arabah. But he didn't know 
there was an ambush waiting from him, for, uh, for him behind the city. Joshua and all Israel pretended to be beaten back by them and fled toward the wilderness. Then all the troops of Ai were summoned to pursue them, pursue them and they pursued Joshua and were drawn away from the city. Not a man was left in Ai or Bethel who did not go after Israel, leaving the city exposed while they pursued Israel. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Hold out the javelin in your hand toward Ai, for I will hand the city over to you. So Joshua held out his javelin toward it. When he held out his hand, the men in ambush rose quickly from their position. They ran, entered the city, captured it, and immediately set it on fire. Men of Ai turned, looked back, and looked back, and the smoke of the city was rising to the sky. They couldn't escape in any direction, and their troops who had fled to the wilderness now became the pursuers. When Joshua and all Israel saw the men in ambush had captured the city, and that smoke was rising from it, they turned back and struck down the men of Ai. And the, men and the men in ambush came out of the city against them, and the men of Ai were trapped between the Israelite forces, some on one side and some on the other. They struck, down, they struck them down until no survivor or fugitive remained. But they captured the king of Ai alive and brought him to Joshua. Verse 24, when Israel had finished killing everyone living in Ai, who had pursued them in the open country, and when, and when every last one of them had fallen to the sword, all Israel returned to Ai and struck it down with the sword. The total of those who fell that day, both men and women, was 12,000, all the people of Ai. Joshua did not draw back his hand that was holding the javelin until all the inhabitants of Ai were completely destroyed. Israel plundered only the cattle and spoil of that city for themselves, according to the Lord's command that he had given Joshua. Verse 28, Joshua burned Ai and left it a permanent ruin, still desolate to this day. He hung the body of the king of Ai on a tree until evening, and at sunset Joshua commanded that they take his body down from the tree. He threw it down at the entrance of the city gate and put a large pile of rocks over it, which still remains to this day. The order here of events differed entirely from that of Jericho. The Israelites didn't march around the walls of Ai seven times. The city walls didn't fall miraculously. As we just read, Israel now had to conquer the city through normal combat operations. This shows us that God, listen carefully, God isn't limited to any one method of working. He isn't and will not be stereotyped by his operations. So the strategy for the capture of AI was ingenious. First, as verse 2 said, it involved placing an ambush behind or west of the city. Once that was established, the next part of his plan involved three contingents of soldiers there in verses 3 to 13. The first was a group of valiant warriors who were sent by night to hide just west of the city of Ai. Their assignment was to rush into the city and burn it after its defenders had deserted it and pursued and, and to pursue Joshua and his army. This unit numbered 30,000. And while it seemed like an excessively large number of soldiers to hide near the city, 
the presence of large rocks in the region made it possible for all these men to stay hidden. The second contingent was the main army which walked 15 miles from Gilgal early the next morning and camped in plain view on the north side of Ai. No doubt this entire force included many thousands of soldiers. Led by Joshua, this army was a diversionary force to decoy, uh, diversionary force, I'm sorry, to decoy the defenders of Ai out of the city. The last and third contingent was another ambush, numbering 5,000 men. These soldiers, who were positioned between Bethel and Ai, were positioned between Beth Bethel and Ai to cut off the possibility of reinforcements from Bethel aiding the men of Ai. Again, meanwhile, Joshua was in the valley north of Ai, a deep ravine in the hills. We're informed after this in verses 14 to 22 that the plan worked to perfection. Again, this was God's plan. This wasn't their plan. This wasn't the plan that, that you know, Joshua had made up in his mind, the, the plan that caused them to, to, to be defeated the first time. No, this was not. They were following exactly to the T, God's plan. And it worked. It worked to perfection. When the king of Ai saw Israel's army, he took the bait, pursuing the Israelites who pretended defeat. The city of Ai, after this, was left unguarded. At Joshua's signal, the other troops quickly entered and set the city on fire. The consternation of the men of Ai was complete as they witnessed those flames, those dark clouds of smoke rising into the sky. Before they can gather their wits, they were caught in a pincher movement of Israel's, Israelite soldiers and were ultimately destroyed. The last part of this passage says that after killing all of Ai soldiers, Israel's army re-entered the city and killed all of its inhabitants. The dead soldiers, we're told, and its citizens totaled 12,000. Plunder was taken from the city by Israel's soldiers, as God said they could in verse 2. The city itself was made into a heap of ruins. And after a small time in, in, in captivity, you know, being captured, the king of Ai was hanged on a tree until evening. And after that, he was buried beneath a pile of stones. Now, what was the significance of that? According to Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse, 20, verse 23, to prevent the profaning and polluting of the land, a dead body hanging from a tree must not remain after the sun has gone down. Here's what's interesting about that directive. It ultimately finds fulfillment in Christ when he hung and died on a tree, the wooden cross, and was taken down from the cross and put into a grave of stone before the sun went down. Amazing, isn't it? Again, mind-blowing. And so, but the difference here between these two events, it should be clear. The people of Ai and their king would die because of their sin, while Jesus, the king of kings, would die and rise from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit 
for sinners like you and me. And so when all was said and done, at the end of the day, when everything, the dust had settled, there now must have been a new sense of faith and courage in Israel. Why? Because they had won another victory. They forgot about the setback, that defeat. They had won a second victory. They beat Jericho, and now they have utterly demolished Ai. The people saw that not one word of God's promise had failed. The disgrace and defeat caused by Achan had now been erased, and Israel was well on their way to conquering the promised land. Chapter 8, verse 29, there ends the first phase of Israel's taking the land. Everything from the victory of Jericho and the defeat and subsequent victory at Ai were significant events in Israel's taking the land. They were significant because they were all firsts. All later victories that we see in this book, in the book of Joshua, were certainly just as dramatic, but generally they don't receive as much attention and focus as Jericho and Ai. The lessons about God's standard, God's standards of holiness and obedience were dramatic. At Jericho, the city fell to Israel in a ritual event. But because of one man, because of one individual who was in his own program and thought he could get away, thought it wouldn't be a big deal to, to do what he wanted to do, because of one man violated God's commands. Thus, Israel as a nation suffered defeat and Achan and his family paid, paid with their lives, and again, all for one act of disobedience. By the end, Ai also paid dearly for its resistance to Israel's God. Not only was it completely annihilated, but its ruin and the heap of stones over its dead king stood as mute reminders of this for decades, if not for centuries. Church, Joshua chapter 7 and Joshua chapter 8 speaks not only about sin, but about God's magnificent grace. Once the stone pile over the late Achan is complete. Once that's done, once that's dealt with, once the people have atoned for their sin and rooted out that evil in their midst, told at the end of chapter 7 that God's anger also ends. And then right away, in verse 1 of this chapter, God reassures Joshua. Again, his anger, he's no longer anger, angry. He reassures Joshua in verse 1, Do not be afraid or discouraged. I have handed over to you the king of Ai, his people, city, and land. I found, we see another, something similar. In another book in the Old Testament, in the book of Micah, the book of Micah closes with a similar beautiful reassurance. In Micah chapter 7, verses 18 and 19, it says this, 
who God is like you? And right away, we should answer this question. No one, no, nothing is like you. But who is a God like you? Forgiving iniquity and passing over rebellion for the rem remnant of his inheritance. He does not hold on to his anger forever because it delights in faithful love. He delights in faithful love. He will again have compassion on us. He will vanquish our iniquities. Let me emphasize that again. He will vanquish our iniquities. You will cast out our sins into the depths of the sea. What's remarkable What's remarkable is the metaphor Micah invokes to picture what God does with forgiven sin. He vanquishes our iniquities, meaning they cannot be recognized anymore, and casts them into the depths of the sea. They'll never be able to return ever again. You know that if you're sitting here today right now and you know that you've been forgiven, you know that your sins have been washed away by the blood of Jesus. Your sins have been wiped away. They've been thrown into the depths of the ocean, never to be brought up again. God won't recognize them. You're there in his kingdom. Imagine God throwing our sins into the far deeper depths of the sea. Imagine the fresh start that results for Israel post HN and for us too after our sins. God's forgiveness dumps them overboard. They're gone, buried, forgotten, unrecoverable. They cannot be thrown accusingly in our faces again. Goodbye, sins. Hello, forgiveness. Of course, it's one thing to know one thing to know that we're forgiven and quite, an, and quite another to actually embrace that forgiveness. There's a lot of Christians who know they're forgiven, but they're still living with that guilt of sin, who are still there. They're embracing, they're still, they haven't embraced that forgiveness Let me tell you here right now, for those that are here, those that are watching, embrace it. Don't just know you're forgiven. Believe it, know it. Now, as I mentioned a bit ago, you may have to go back to AI in order to get healing. Find that healing. I know that in my time of having to recover from my addictions, one of the steps I had to take was to go out and reconcile, find reconciliation with those that I've hurt, with those that had hurt me, to forgive them and to forgive those, I mean, to, to ask for forgiveness, to forgive those who had wronged me. And it was difficult, yes, I know. And it had to begin right there, right in front of me with my wife. If you knew me back 15, 20 years ago, you would have known that I was a very prideful man, very stubborn man. I had a lot of anger and hurt in my heart. And I took it out mostly on my wife. 
I blamed her. Every time I saw her and her goodness and her heart, I was reminded of how ugly my heart was. And if you've been there before, you know that you treat people horribly. I did that for many years. So yeah, I had to go to her and ask her sincerely to forgive me. Now at the time, maybe she, well, we weren't really together. We were separated, and but she wanted to also see that I was being sincere. And it took time to prove that. But, you know, I was sincere about my forgiveness. Now, I mention this because, again, maybe that's what you need to do. Maybe there's something, there's someone out there, there's, some, there's something that uh, it's in your heart that, they, that they've done and they've hurt you really bad. Or you've hurt them. Find healing. Find reconciliation. Ask for forgiveness. If you're unable to, another step that I took was, you know, I, I wrote them letters. I didn't send them out, but I wrote them letters. I just, after that, I, you know, some people burn them. I just kind of crumpled it up and threw it away. But that was, I asked for forgiveness, and that helped me. I went back to those places, all to my AIs. I'm sure that all, my, all those AIs, and I'm sure there's probably still many more that I haven't dealt with. I hope that I have. Now that I think about it, I'm pretty sure I've dealt with them. But, you know, again, I have to, you know, always have to re-examine that. But what I'm saying is, friends, church, it's important to go back to those AIs. Embrace that forgiveness that God has given you through the blood of Jesus. That's what he died on the cross for. That's why his hands were pierced. His feet was pierced. That's why he was tortured and mocked, ridiculed. He did all that for you, to forgive you, to make you holy, to make you righteous. The challenge, my friends, is to let God's truth erase the, our memories of failure and silence our self-criticism. And oh, how we're, many of us are so good at self-criticism. Again, the challenge to let God's truth. And what is God's truth? Again, Jesus died for you. Are you a new person? Let those truth erase your memories a failure, not erase all your memories, and for, you know, but just to erase those memories of failure and silence our self-criticism. Great relief follows when we do so. The elated feeling of a newly freed prisoner throwing off tight handcuffs and heavy leg irons. Before I close, I just want to mention this one last thing that we see here in this rematch at AI. For those who weren't aware, redemption means to buy back. It signals a second chance. It signals a second chance transaction. And so just as God gave Joshua and Israel a second chance to defeat Ai, God sent Jesus, the greater Joshua, to redeem humanity lost as a result of Adam's sin. Redemption it wasn't purchased by silver or gold, or diamonds, or 
anything that's valuable here in this earth. But by the precious blood of the Lamb of God who died and was raised for our justification by the Spirit of God. You've been redeemed, my brother and sister in Christ. Jesus, he paid the price. And now you're free. You're forgiven. Those shackles of sin and death no longer hold you down. They no longer hold you prisoner. And if you remain steadfast, if you endure, if you obey, if you just continue to walk with Jesus, learn from your defeats, remove those things in your heart, in your life that are weighing you down, that are causing you to, to keep your focus off of him. You remove those things and just completely surrender to him, those things to him. And he, you, that you will feel, you will have that freedom. He wants to free you. But because of our stubbornness, we often just shack, put shackles back on ourselves. Believe, embrace in the Lord's forgiveness. There may be some of you watching this message right now that want that redemption. You know that you've blown it. You know that you've messed up. And now you want to be forgiven. You know in your heart that you need Jesus, that you need forgiveness. The Lord is calling you. Don't turn your back on him. Don't refuse him. You have... Yes, you have the free will to do that if you, want, if you want to, but the reality is, the truth is, you don't know if there will be a tomorrow or if there will be a five minutes or ten minutes. Accept his forgiveness today. Accept his forgiveness now. He will begin changing your life. He will begin to transform your heart, your mind, when his spirit comes and makes his home in you. But you must be born again. And if that's what you'd like, if you'd like to be born again, and you've never prayed for forgiveness, well, I want to help you do that. I want to help lead you in a prayer to Accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So whether you're here, whether you're watching, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head and know that God sees your heart. He knows what's really going on. He knows if you're sincere or if you're just, if you're not sincere. But if you are, Come to the cross of Jesus. I pray this. Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. And I ask now that you forgive me of my sins. I ask for your forgiveness. I now believe that you died for my sins and three days later rose from the dead. I repent. I turn from my sins and confess you and you alone as my personal Lord and Savior. Savior. Jesus, thank you for dying for me, 
thank you for forgiving me. And thank you for saving me. I now ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me and teach me, instruct me, and show me the depths of God's love. The depths of your grace and mercy. So that I may also share the second chance that you've given me and help people come to the cross, lead people to the cross. Use me now as your instrument, as your vessel. In your name, amen. For those watching, again, if you prayed that, please reach out to us. Do you want to hear from you? We want to know how you, you prayed that. And, and uh, if you need help finding a church, we can help you do that. If you're here in El Paso, we invite you to come visit us here in Northeast El Paso. Thank you for checking us out this morning. There was a reason why you did, and, and I believe God's purpose is getting fulfilled um, at this very moment. So I hope you have a great week. Be a blessing to others. We look forward to, to seeing you again next week as we finish off Chapter 8. Be blessed. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.